I rise today to speak to Bill C-311, an act to ensure Canada assumes its responsibilities in preventing dangerous climate change, or as it's known, the Climate Change Accountability Act. This is an issue that's very important to me as a Nova Scotian, as a Canadian, and as a citizen of the world. A desire to see meaningful action on climate change is one of the reasons I decided to run for election, and it's one of the reasons I decided to run for the New Democratic Party the party who first raised this issue in the House over 20 years ago. That spirited advocacy on behalf of our planet continues today with this bill. I'm pleased to see the bill returning to the House after the endurance test that it faced in the last Parliament. In my work with the Halifax's Ecology Action Centre, we watched from a distance as Conservative filibustering at committee kept the first version, C-377, in limbo from December 11, 2007 to April 28, 2008. Good grief. When that bill finally passed, I joined with thousands of other Canadians to celebrate in this world first a victory for, the climate, for climate change and for Canada. Here, here. Mr. Speaker, Bill C-311 mandates the government to live up to Canada's obligations under international climate change agreements. These agreements aren't merely suggestions and governments are expected to have policies in place to bring them into compliance. While the failures of governments for the last 15 years to deal with climate change are well documented, it must not be used as an excuse to do the minimum when faced with a crisis of this magnitude. At this point in our nation's history, we're past the debate about whether or not climate change is real, and we're past the debate about what causes it, and we're nearly past the point of debate about how we should address it. There is consensus among the world's leading scientists, environmentalists, and ordinary Canadians. We know we need targets for reducing greenhouse gases. We know that those targets need to be science-based and enforced by binding caps, and we also know that these measures need to be organized through a national emission trading regime. This government has failed to act on each of these areas, but I'm happy to say that this bill will provide some real direction on climate change policy in Canada. The reduction targets in this bill are specified for the short, medium, and long term, but with built-in flexibility to adjust over time. Most importantly, as others have pointed out during the course of this debate, this bill introduces legal certainty as well as government accountability, something we've heard this government aspire to on so many occasions. With targets set into law, Canada can finally make progress on its international obligations, and our already germinating green economy can flourish and bloom. Our country is filled with bright minds who have already been tackling the climate change issue with innovative solutions, many of which I've had the opportunity to see firsthand in Nova Scotia. Industry recognizes that they must adapt or they'll vanish, and they're taking steps to get where they should be. All they lack is a partner in the federal government and some certainty that emission regulations will be predictable and stable. The Climate Change Accountability Act does just that. It sets out these regulations in five-year increments until 2050. It's legislation that is first of its kind in this country, and it deserves the support of this House. Opposition to this bill from government side has unfortunately relied on that tired argument that you can choose either the environment or the economy, but not both. Well, previous governments have been trying that one for quite some time, Mr. Speaker, and the result is a world that is even closer to catastrophic climate change and an economy that are both in shambles. Now is the time when we should be taking stock of where we've been and where we want to go. Our twin crises, economic and environmental, can both be addressed with smart public policy that measures sustainability and prosperity with the same yardstick. So why the same rhetoric about the economic cost of a bill that will finally take on climate change? There's really no excuse, Mr. Speaker, because the economic costs are significantly greater if we don't act now. For every moment that we waste, the greater cost will pass on to our children and our neighbors' children. It calls to mind a novelty mug that my partner was given as a gift. It's got this map of the world on it, and when you add hot water, the shorelines change based on rising sea levels thanks to a warming earth. Suddenly, Brazil's gone. Bye-bye Bangladesh, and it's so long Indonesia. And by the time my tea is cold enough to drink, 
Nova Scotia has all but disappeared. This mug can get a chuckle out of our guests, but the sad fact is that it's an accurate description of what we can expect to happen if emissions are allowed to grow unchecked. It's not a joke, Mr. Speaker. We're only a few years away from a projected two degree temperature rise, after which we may be too late to halt some of the worst effects of the crisis. In a column in Halifax's Chronicle Herald, Professor Sheila Zerbrig describes the realities in much more compelling terms, and I'll quote from her article. The ultimate irony is that those least responsible for global warming will bear by far the most catastrophic consequences. Most greenhouse gas emissions, over 80%, added to the atmosphere are ours, not theirs, and continue to come from the rich industrialized countries. Yet the gravest outcomes the IPCC scientists warn about are to a considerable extent preventable. The necessary technology and energy efficiency methods already exist that would allow us to make major GHG reductions right away, but only if we act immediately, intelligently, and together." End quote. Professor Zerbrig is a medical historian whose area of expertise is actually the history of famines. And the last that she and I spoke, she looked me in the eye, we were talking about climate change, and she had such fear in her eyes. And she said to me that with a two degree increase, this is going to mean widespread, devastating famines, unlike we've ever seen in the course of human history. And she said to me, we need to act now. We need to act now or we won't be able to feed the world's citizens. Another signal that the time is right for this bill is the change of administration in the United States. The new president was elected in part because of his dramatically different vision for environmental policy. And this shift represents a unique opportunity for Canada to act in concert with our largest trading partner. And I acknowledge my honorable colleague from Wetaskiwin who earlier commented about our partnership with the United States. Let's go further. While some states and provinces have gone forward with emission trading markets between themselves, Canada as a country has not acted to promote this sector. It's just one of the ways that this bill can help steer our country in the right direction. In closing, Mr. Speaker, we must, as parliamentarians, as Canadians, and as global citizens, support this bill. We need to be visionary, bold, and innovative, and we must act now before it's too late. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well,